Yes. No, no, uh, no va. What do you want? You want? Yes. Muy buenas tardes para todos. Gracias por estar con nosotros de nuevo. Ahora daremos paso a la segunda conferencia del día de hoy, titulada ¿Cómo la educación abierta puede cambiar el mundo? a cargo del doctor Steven Downs. Él es especialista en tecnología de aprendizaje en línea y nuevos medios a través de una carrera de 25 años en el campo. Ha desarrollado y desplegado una serie de tecnologías progresivamente más innovadoras. Steven es quizás mejor conocido en su boletín diario All Day, que se distribuye por web, correo electrónico y RSS a miles de suscriptores de todo el mundo, y también como el creador de los MOOCs. Es una voz líder en línea y aprendizaje en red, autor de la gestión del aprendizaje y el software de sindicación de contenidos. También es reconocido como una voz líder en el movimiento de la educación abierta. A él le damos la bienvenida con un fuerte aplauso. Gracias por estar con nosotros, doctor. Buenas tardes. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. The topic today is open education and the role of open education in preserving and promoting the peace. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to talk about that, particularly from the perspective of somebody who has worked in open education for a very long time. I've come to believe in the benefits and to know the methods and the strategies for creating open education that is effective and that promotes peace and development in society. What is open education? Well, At its core, it's a philosophy about the way people should produce, share, and build on knowledge. It's something that proponents believe is a method by which people should have access to high-quality educational opportunities and resources. And by this, we don't just mean courses. We don't just mean classes but we mean access to the educational system as a whole. One of the major aspects of open education, though, is the open educational resource. Some of you may already be familiar with this. We've already talked about it to some degree. But at its core, the open educational resource is a resource, whether it's digital or non-digital, it doesn't matter, that can be used to support education, however we conceive of education, and that is available without cost to people to use, to access, to store, to reuse, to share with their friends, and to adapt to create new materials. And all of these elements are important to the concept of open educational resources. The reason why open educational resources are important for so many social and cultural effects is because of the nature of knowledge in society. And with open education, knowledge is not only the product of the people in the community, it's also what is what we call reified, which is a $10 word, which means we as a community make something true. 
It's not just true by itself. It's not just true because one person says it is. It becomes true because all of us together say it is true. When we have open educational resources, we have the capacity as a community to make the things that are important to us true. I like to think of open educational resources and of education in general, the subjects, the textbooks, and all of the rest of that, as though they were a conversation that we have with ourselves. And where these resources, a book, a piece of video, an image, an animation, these are like words in the conversation that we have. And we are able to have this conversation only if everybody has access to the words. Open education is like a kind of social literacy. It's a way to enable each other to talk in these words with each other. It forces us to think about how words are used. It forces us to think about what is possible and what is blocked in open education. Consider how we use words in education. Consider how the use of words, the use of resources can either liberate us or block us. That takes me to my main topic that I want to address today. There we go. And that's how open education can change the world, can change Colombia, can change society for the better and for ultimately for peace. That's very long. I, this is an image I saw just a couple of days ago here in Colombia, in uh, Rio Negro, actually. And I took that picture as an image because it's a person's handprints on a wall. And we look at that, and it looks like nothing. It looks like somebody was just being, well, messy. <laughs> But it's a way of a person saying, I am here, I was here. My presence is important. And this is the key and core message that we want to communicate with each other with open educational resources. Because everybody in society, every citizen, ultimately is seeking a peaceful transformation of society toward a future that includes them, just like the hand on the wall. And it's a future that includes them, not them becoming like everybody else, although that might be part of it, but them becoming important and self-sufficient and capable as an individual. And so this is the primary purpose of education. This is the primary reason why it's important that we learn to read and to write and to communicate with each other and work together and the rest of it. Now digital technology, which is the technology that I've used for the last 20 years to promote open education, has transformed society. Some ways good, some ways bad. Now I told this story in Rio Negro, if you heard it two days ago, I'm sorry. I'm gonna tell it again. <laughs> Think about three things. What these three things have in common, or I'll do it like a European. What these three things have in common. Justin Bieber, 
our great Canadian gift to the world. The Arab Spring and the Oculus Rift. They seem very different, don't they? Let me ask, how many of you have heard of Justin Bieber? Oh, man. The other group was much better. <laughs> you never heard of it? Well, that kind of ruins the whole story. <laughs> oh, okay, that's better. <laughs> Baby, baby. No. <laughs> I guess that's very old, Justin Bieber. Now, it's so I was walking uh, in a park in um, Monterrey, in Mexico, and some kids were walking the other way. They saw me, and I looked like a Canadian. So they start going, baby, baby, baby. It was a very strange experience. <laughs> Justin Bieber became famous because he recorded himself singing in his bedroom on YouTube. That's it. That's all it took. Just an ordinary kid in Canada with an extraordinary voice who became famous just by singing in his bedroom. That's transformation. That was not possible before. The Arab Spring, a series of movements in countries across the Arab world, from Morocco to Algeria, Tunisia, where I've been many times and the society has transformed completely, Egypt, Syria, where it went much less well. But what made all of these possible was people communicating with each other openly a conversation about what they wanted their society to be. There's a lot in common between Arab Spring and Justin Bieber, right? It was ordinary people. Oculus Rift is a virtual reality helmet. Good technology, lots of fun. Oculus Rift was created through funding on Kickstarter. It was later bought for a billion dollars. But the people who created Oculus Rift were individuals like you and me and Justin Bieber and whoever else, each contributing a few dollars on Kickstarter to make this technology possible. Ordinary people defining what they wanted the technology to look like. That's what's changed in the last 20 years. And it hasn't just changed in Canada. I look at you, I see all the earphones. I know you're not listening to music. Uh, I see all your mobile phones, etc. Digital technology has reached to every corner of the world. Not equally, and that's part of what we talk about today, but it has had a transforming effect on society. How big? Well, five billion people in the world have a mobile phone. Think about that. There are a total of eight billion individual mobile phone accounts because some people have two. And almost everybody, even the people here high up on the hill, have access to a mobile phone they don't own one, but they could access one if they need to. Not everybody, by any means, but almost. Also equally significant, millions, billions of people have access to resources like videos and other materials on sites like YouTube and Facebook talked about Justin Bieber, but equally well, I could talk about Khan Academy, which grew up as an educational resource on Facebook, or even the video that I watched last night, which was about the battles of Attila the Hun as he invaded Europe. Okay, it's not light viewing, but it was fun. Digital technology has transformed society created entire industries. It makes possible buildings like that. It informs people. 
And most importantly, it gives us the opportunity to connect with each other in our communities and across oceans in a way that was never possible before. Even more importantly, more fundamental than that, because it puts these capacities into our hand, it gives at least the possibility for each one of us to have our own a belief in our own capacity. It's the skill of self-advocacy, the skill of believing that I can do something, the skill of being able to work together with both my friends and my enemies to build something bigger. It might just be a painting on a bridge, or it might be the bridge. Open education comes into being in this environment. And this is why I'm so excited to be working in this area. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it began as email lists. You sign up for a list, you start sending messages to other people by email. Or something called Usenet, which is dead now. But basically, it was an early version of an online discussion board. And there were Usenet groups for all kinds of different topics. There was even one called, what was it? Um, Alt, Alt, Wesley Crusher, die, die, die. Okay. It was a group for people who did not like a certain character in Star Trek. That's the other thing. I mean, you know, sometimes people forget this. What makes the internet great, what makes all of these things great, this is not in the slide, but is that they're fun. It's not just that we can do so much, but we can enjoy ourselves doing it. I like to tell people we take a trillion dollars worth of technology, decades worth of investments, and we use it to send pictures of our cats to each other. That's the kind of society I want to live in. And this spirit of the internet, the spirit of talking to each other and sharing with each other, it grew with the World Wide Web. People created their own web pages. People created wikis, like Wikipedia, for sharing knowledge with each other. People created social networks. Some of them are good. Some of them, <coughs> Facebook, are not so good. Sorry, I couldn't resist. They built online classrooms, and they built massive open online courses. Here's an example. Open courseware. How many of you have heard of Open Courseware? Give some. The rest of you, after you have homework now, go to Google and look up Open Courseware or just OCW. This was an initiative by MIT. They saw other people doing this and they said, this is a really good idea. What they did is they decided that they would share all the materials from all of their classes. The readings, the syllabi, the assignments. They would share some animations, they would share some quizzes and software. They made it, put it all out in the open. Millions of people around the world have used that. It's created an entire industry in India. Nearly as many people using open courseware are, are what they call self-learners. People who are not in a formal class, but who are just learning on their own. Something like open courseware gives people a capacity that they did not have before. Now I am known in some circles 
as one of the people who created the open on sorry, the massive don't even get my own thing right. The massive open online course. My colleague George Siemens and I, along with Dave Cormier and Brian Alexander and a bunch of other people, created this in 2008. We called it Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. And the idea of the massive open online course was that we would share not only the materials, but the actual teaching of the class. But we also wanted to honor the idea of open education and open educational resources. So in our massive open online courses, we didn't have a professor giving a lecture that everyone would have to listen to. We had resources that we found from all over the internet, and we would share those resources, we would exchange those resources, People in the class would make new resources and they would share them with each other. And we created what is basically a network of interconnected services and resources. Very different from a traditional classroom where one person tells you what to believe and everybody else believes it. And this transformation was made possible both by the new technology, but also by embracing the idea of openness in our teaching. We have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be open? Well, it's a philosophy, as I said at the beginning of the talk, about the way people should produce and share knowledge. But it's more than just that. It's the idea that you're accepting of other people's ideas, resources, thoughts, opinions, ways of life, and you're willing to share your own thoughts, opinions, beliefs, opinions, ways of life. Being open is about being in a conversation, about being in a community. This challenges the role of the traditional university and the traditional education system. And in the panel before lunch, some of these remarks were very pointedly and I believe correctly made. And in some cases, in some quarters, people believe that the university should primarily be responsible for elevating itself to becoming a world-class university to maximizing the value of its teaching and its resources for itself. And there is an argument for that. There is an argument. It places them on an equal footing with world-class universities around the rest of the world. But the problem is the only people who benefit from that are the people in that university. And the argument has been offered, and I agree with this argument, that the task should be not to build excellent universities. The task should be to build an excellent system as a whole. If one part of the system is broken, the entire system is broken. It's like a chain, right? You don't just focus on building one link really strongly. You need each link to be strong. You need each part of society to be strong. You need to build the weakest so that they can work with the strongest in order to build the most quality, most quality, the, the best society possible. Can't believe I said the most quality. Now, there are challenges. This, is a, this doesn't just happen. If, if I have learned anything in working in this field for 20, 25 years, it's that there is a lot of failure. Uh, we make a lot of mistakes. Uh, I intend to continue making mistakes. Um, but 
as a community, we can rise and meet the challenges. One of the mistakes that's commonly made, and it's something that I'm always aware of and careful about, is the mistake of making the rich richer and the poor poorer. And there are many educational initiatives that sadly to say do that. And this has been a criticism of open education as well, and you should be aware that this is a criticism, that people will argue this way and that they have good reasons for arguing this way. For example, in the mass of open online courses that were created after George and I created our first course, people found that mostly the people who were benefiting from massive open online courses were already university graduates, were already professionals. We were helping the professionals become even more educated. But, but, the proportion is much different when we start talking about the less able and the less fortunate. The same study that said a whole bunch of Americans in universities benefited from a massive open online course also showed, this is for one course, 9,148 people from Columbia completing this course for free. That's not nothing. And that's the sort of advance that I am looking for. You know, it's pretty easy to criticize something when you say, well, it just makes the rich richer. But the important thing is it makes the poor richer even more quickly. Okay. I'll ask you the slide. Another criticism, and it's a fair criticism, and I say that someone from North America speaking to you in English, is that open online learning has a colonizing effect, that it propagates the thoughts and the values and the beliefs of Western society, and especially North American and European society around the world. And, yeah, sorry. Uh, but, but again, that's not the whole story. The whole story is that because of the nature of open online learning, because it is relatively inexpensive to produce, and because it is equitable and able to be shared, people in different parts of the world can create and share their own massive open online courses. Here in Colombia, for example, we have MOOCs that have been produced by the University of Los Andes in Bogota, Javeriana, Javeriana, well, I can't do that. <laughs> How about Rihanna? Um, which uses edX. And uh, at Pereira, where I spoke a few years ago. And these are MOOCs. These are cases of open educational resources by Colombians for Colombians. And that's the way it should be. And that's the model that's beginning to develop around the world. I worked with French-speaking people in the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. I threw in some French just for the translator. And we worked on creating a MOOC on open educational resources for the French-speaking world. The same thing with Arab countries in North Africa and the Middle East. And we produced resources that help people in these countries become literate in their own language. That's the promise, right? The promise is if you create your own MOOCs, if you create your own open educational resources, then you create and promote and share your own culture with the rest of the world and you become stronger. And that's what's supposed to happen. And 
the potential of the MOOC is not just to help the people who are here in the university. It's not just to help the people who are able to go to school. We look at, <coughs> excuse me, not just Colombia, but countries around the world where for one reason or another, people have been unable to go to school. Whether it's from national or natural disaster or from conflict or from poverty, they have not had the opportunity. Open online learning we have seen is a method to reach them. Again, it doesn't happen automatically. There needs to be a lot of work put into place to make these resources accessible. But when that work is done, well, look at the people who are using MOOCs now. Fewer than half of them, fewer than half the people taking MOOCs in Colombia, the Philippines, and South Africa have completed higher education. A quarter of them reported high school as the highest level of education that they've reached. MOOCs are reaching into communities where people do not have access to education. That's what we need to do. The IMF not always, my friend. The IMF says the success of low-income low country programs increasingly depends on two factors, and I would agree with this. Minimum levels of government spending on health, education, and social safety net. Without that investment, it doesn't happen automatically. And secondly, specific reform measures to protect vulnerable groups. And there's a variety of groups, and I don't want to get into the, you know, I'm going to classify them, but the IMF does. But there's a variety of groups that, for one reason or another, are in a position of vulnerability and have not been able to access resources, are not in socially the best situation, are poor, are injured, whatever. And these are the people that we have to spend the most effort on. As Utah says, we have to begin at the edges. We have to begin at the point of clearest need. We think of open education too, when we think of providing access, not just as courses, not just as resources. Think of it as sharing the practices, the way you do things on a day-to-day -day basis. Think of it as sharing the tools. And, you know, not just pieces of software. Uh, a little story. We were at a lab, and uh, the, the people in the lab showed us some of their new equipment that they got. And Yuda asked them, um, did you pay for these yourselves? And they said, yes, we paid for these ourselves. And she said, well, there are programs from companies that will help you fund this equipment for your lab. And they, did, they had never heard of us, right? Sharing that kind of information is sharing the tools for learning. People don't know what they don't know. Think of it as more than just employment and economy. Think of it as more than just helping people get jobs. But think of open education as promoting the skills and the attitudes fundamental to learning and growing together in a society. Learning how to not just talk to each other, but learning how to disagree with each other. Learning how to argue with each other and make your case. Learning how to negotiate learning how to mediate, learning how to resolve conflict. All of these are parts of education. So what is the way forward? What is the path ahead for open education? Well, in a study done by the Commonwealth of Learning, which is an English organization with people involved in countries around the world, Canada, India, South Africa, Australia, Kenya. 
They felt that fewer than half of the people surveyed felt that people had the necessary skills to access, use, and share open educational resources. So then let's think about these skills for a second. Well, there's skills in how to use the technology, how to use your phone to its best advantage as a learning tool, as a teaching tool, how to talk to each other using digital technologies, how to communicate, how to create resources, but also to how to express oneself visually, textually, metaphorically, and how to create. All of these are essential. And it sounds like a very tall, you know, difficult task, and I won't lie to you, it is a very difficult task, but it's, it's where the beginning has to be. Giving people, no, no, not giving people, sharing our knowledge with people who want it and would like to use it in order to advance. Same survey, only 41% thought that there were sufficient open educational resources in the language or languages of their own country. <laughs> Let's do the same survey here, because it's fun. How many of you think there are enough learning resources available in Spanish? <laughs> How many of you do not think there are enough learning resources available in Spanish? Yeah. So again, we get very similar results. What's the best way for there to be more learning resources available in Spanish? Ask yourself that. My answer is really simple. Create them. Make them and then share them. Creating open educational resources, indeed, is more than just creating education that other people can use. A lot of people who talk about open educational resources talk about, well, I'm going to help somebody else. I'm going to give my knowledge to someone else for free. But what I've discovered is that creating and sharing open educational resources is also the best way to develop myself as a teacher, myself as an educator. Every time I share what I know, it gets a little bit better, a little bit sharper, a little bit clearer. And this is something that's been known for a very long time. In his autobiography, John Stuart Mill talked about the value to himself of creating, learning, and teaching his younger, uh, his younger uh, brothers and sisters. In a country, the creation of a mechanism for building and sharing educational resources is at the same time the creation of a mechanism to build a national community of educators and to build national instructional capacity generally. This is something that we've seen for ourselves in Canada and that we've embraced in Canada. And this is why I've come to see the value of this. There's uh, an organization called BC Campus. BC, or British Columbia, is a province in Canada. Not like, uh, and it's Antioch, right? Thank you. That's so embarrassing. And what they did is they launched a national initiative, or a provincial initiative, to help educators in the province create and share open educational resources. They didn't hire some company to come in and build 100,000 resources. They provided tools and instruction and some financing and some space for
for people to create these resources themselves. And this initiative has proven to be tremendously successful. It's an initiative that has been replicated in Canada's most populous province, in the province where I live, in Ontario, in something called Campus Ontario. <coughs> and it saves them money. Money. How much money? Um, in one year, uh, somewhere between eight million and nine million dollars. So that's not government savings, that's student savings. The students of the province saved somewhere between eight and nine million dollars that year, which is a lot of money. So, I want to conclude not by speaking to you as a Canadian telling Colombians how to find peace, because I think you're finding that for yourself, which makes me really happy, because I love Colombia. I'm going to quote from Jose Restrepo, <laughs> who I've never met, but who published a paper um, last October, and he's uh, the former head of uh, Rosario University. And so he, he published this paper at an international education and economic development conference, saying basically there are four ways to use education to achieve peace, four steps in the process. Now, these are his proposals, but they seem really reasonable to me. The first principle is redistribution. I don't mean, and I'm sure he doesn't mean, you know, uh, taking all the money of the, out of the banks and giving it away. But there has to be a redistribution. There has to be mechanisms that enable people who have been left without to get a start. I mean, Canada, this is a fundamental principle. In Canada, every person receives an education. In Canada, every person receives enough money for housing and for food. Pardon? Sorry. Um, so, what he's saying is that there should be scholarships for students from low-income families, and especially from areas of conflict. And there should be an increase in capacity, social and community capacity, in communications, information technology, and learning. But that's only where you start. His second step in the use of open education to promote peace and development in a society is recognition. And this is why I began the, this talk with the hands on the wall. Understanding that people are valuable in and of themselves. That each person is important. That the professor is important, but so is the person selling candies in the middle of the road. It's a recognition that gender equality and diversity matter. It's a recognition that different classes, different ethnic groups, different races, different language groups, and you know, I'm not, again, not going to categorize people, but each person, no matter who they are, where they're from, is equally worth and deserving of the full support of society to learn and become a contributing member. And it's an especial focus on providing extra effort for the training and development of indigenous communities, of ex-combatants, of people who have survived the war, and people who are looking for a better life. The third step is representation. The idea of working together. The idea of 
developing the capacity as a community to rebuild a society or you know to build a society to sharing what we know about the importance of human rights and teaching the next generation the tools and the skills and the abilities to be able to work together to solve problems and to disagree. And then finally, his fourth step, and the last thing that I'll have to say to you today, is reconciliation. Promoting peaceful conflict resolution. Sometimes we talk about that as the rule of law, but really it's something a lot more pragmatic. It's having the skills to express our needs, to express our feelings, to say what we want, and to say what we're willing to do, what we're willing to give in order to make these things possible. These are the paths and they're things you have to learn. You're not born knowing them. I, I took courses in mediation. I took courses in negotiation for a union. Um, I took courses in conflict resolution, bargaining skills, all kinds of things like that. And these are the kind of skills that are needed in order to help people work together in a society. And it's not just the individual skills, it's teaching groups of skills, just like you would teach a football team on the field, how to work together, how to pass the ball and how to achieve a common goal, or to together each of us help ourselves achieve our individual goals. That's my talk, that's Botero's hand. Thank you very much. Agradecemos al doctor, al doctor Steven por haber estado con nosotros, por su intervención. A partir de este momento iniciamos una sesión de preguntas. Si usted tiene alguna pregunta, le pedimos nos levante la mano, pasaremos donde usted, le entregaremos el micrófono para poder hacer la pregunta entonces al doctor. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? Just moving. No questions, just moving on. Sí, sí, sí. Oh, no, there's questions, but... Yes. I'm sorry to take you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Johnny Serón. Tengo una pregunta. No pensé que estaba al frente de la persona de los creadores del rock. Me siento complacido. Eh, miré su nombre, vi a Wikipedia y dije, wow, usted con, con Siemens, con Dios, fueron los creadores del de, de primer mob en el mundo. Me siento con, realmente complacido. La pregunta es, bueno, yo, yo veo una empresa muy grande y la he estado estudiando, y los mob también, eh, con, con Usera. Con Usera con 30 millones de estudiantes, con más de 2.700 cursos en línea, con más de 160 especializaciones, con más de 4 maestrías. Eh, pues está en, en, en el mundo está haciendo un cambio significativo pero al, al, al CEO de Cursera le preguntaban sobre, eh, sobre la investigación ¿qué pasa con los MOOC? porque los estudiantes tienden a, a, a hacer un MOOC pero tienden a no investigar la investigación se va perdiendo eso uno y lo otro es que está de acuerdo que, que sirvan los MOOC como créditos académicos en una universidad Okay. There, there are different aspects to that question. Um, l let me address the question of research and let me address the question of Coursera. Um, Coursera is not the only MOOC. It's not even the best MOOC. It's not even close to the best MOOC, right? Um, and there are hundreds of different MOOC providers around the world. And Coursera is the one that most of all has focused on teaching as 
creating some videos and a few resources, having people do some quiz, and that's it. That's not what we created, right? Uh, they took the idea that we, we created and then they turned it into this standardized thing. It's like George and I created steak and steak and fries and a beautiful dinner and they invented McDonald's and said, this is what we'll do. Okay, maybe bad analogy. But what we were trying to do and what I believe will be the long-term future of the MOOC is that we invited students into our research. So our first MOOC was called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. And if you look up on Wikipedia under Connectivism, you should, you never know these days, but you should find my name and George Seaman's name. Connectivism is a philosophy about the nature of knowledge and the nature of teaching. So we were and we continue to do research in this area. And what we did is we said, we're going to do what we called a course of lectures or a course of talks, a course of conversations more accurately about our work. And we're going to show you how we think about things, how we develop our ideas, how we think education should be offered. So we were opening our practice. We did not set out to invent a MOOC. That was an accident. We set out to work openly. And the MOOC is what resulted. And in the long-term future of the MOOC, that is what it will be. It will be you and you and you and you know, a researcher in physics and a researcher in, well, I saw dress design um, and a researcher, I saw a manga display just in the other room, working openly, sharing their practice. And so it might be a manga artist saying, over 10 weeks, I'm going to show you how I create a manga from beginning to end. And that'll be a MOOC. And so the idea here is that the teaching and the research are one and the same. In the MOOC as properly applied and not as offered by Coursera. Does that help? Oh, okay. In a moment. Bueno, en Colombia existe un contexto muy particular en cuanto a los recursos educativos abiertos. En la pasada década, en el año 2005 hasta 2010, hizo una inversión muy fuerte en el Ministerio de Educación y se creó una, una, una estrategia de banco de frente de aprendizaje. Eso murió en el 2010. En el 2012 se tomó un nuevo impulso, se invirtió realmente en dinero en eso, cerca de 500 millones de pesos. Se creó la Estrategia Nacional de Recursos Educativos Digitales Abiertos con la ministra o orden de lanzamientos, el primer libro, etc. Pero cuando hubo cambio de gobierno, eso quedó ahí. Que el nuevo gobierno, las nuevas personas que llegaron de pronto, estaban al frente de eso, dijeron que no, pues eso no era prioridad. Entonces, hay personas que en universidades, en instituciones, estamos haciendo la tarea, estamos procurando hacer producción de recursos para digital abiertos, haciendo la gestión, aprendiendo, aprendiendo, aprendiendo. Pero, para el gobierno eso no es significativo en este momento. ¿Cómo se podría hacer de pronto? Hacerle ver al gobierno lo que eso realmente puede significar. Una, una operación de de la Estrategia Nacional de Recursos de Educación Digital Abierto que realmente pueda significar no solo educación superior, sino educación básica y media para el país. Oh, yeah. Governments are fickle. <laughs> uh, I've worked in a government agency for the last 16 years. We've had conservative governments, we've had liberal governments, and you never know what they're going to do from one government to the next. 
That's the nature of it. That's a good thing in some ways. It's a bad thing in other ways. You know, it's hard when the government does not share your priorities. Um, <laughs> if it's any consolation, our government never shares my priorities. So. But, I mean, you ask a serious question. Uh, how do you convince the government? And uh, there's ultimately, if your government is anything like our government, and, you know, and I'm sure there are differences, but in the case of our government, and in the case of the other governments that I've worked with around the world, what you need to do is, and, and this is kind of a slogan, uh, show value, right? Show the benefits. And this is a process, this is one of these tools and skills I talked about having the capacity to learn. Um, because every government has a different agenda, right? And so what you need to do is show the steps from what you are doing to how it meets the government's agenda. And that's not always the easiest thing to do, especially if they have not a very good agenda. But there's always a way, right? And because most governments want to grow, most governments want to develop, most governments want to see an increase in the national income, the GDP, trade, whatever, right? A variety of these things. So what you need to do is look at what the government is trying to achieve. You have to begin there, right? It's, it's like service everywhere. You have to look at what they need. And look at that and say, how does open education, how does my work in education and open educational resources work to meet that end? And so what you need to do here is impacts that your work can have. So simple example. Um, my open resource can save students $8 million. Remember, it was right in the talk, right? So then, so you identify these key indicators showing what your work does, the concrete thing. And then you create, they call this a logic model. You create a logic model that shows here are the indicators, here are the benefits that the government wants to realize, and here are the steps that show how my indicator supports their benefit. You see the process? This is what you know, companies do, this is what consultants do, uh, this is how they get government money, is they do this thing. And if you do this thing, show the benefits, show how it impacts their priorities, that will help with the support. There's no guarantees. There's many, many voices competing for limited resources, but you have to show how it helps advance their agenda. There's no other way. Sorry. Mi pregunta está relacionada a en qué momento los MOOCs se convirtieron en un negocio, ¿sí? Porque, claro, la filosofía y de hecho, como vosotros lo habéis concebido, es que es el contenido educativo que es para compartir. Pero si una universidad, por ejemplo, quiere poner un MOOC en la plataforma EDES, eh, eso más o menos cuesta alrededor de medio millón de dólares. O sea, ¿en qué momento entonces pasó eso? de ser la filosofía de compartir el conocimiento a un negocio. Claro, y por eso en Colombia las universidades, los Andes, la Javeriana, pues son las universidades que pueden costearse eh, pues eso. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, um, we created our MOOC in 2008, and uh, 
I developed software to use to uh, create this MOOC. As well, we used some other software that was available, uh, open source software, because we had no budget, nothing. Um, because I'm not good at raising money. <laughs> Uh, despite what I just said, I know the process, I'm just not very good at it. Um, and three years later, in 2011, two professors from Stanford University, uh, Norvig and Thrun, um, launched an artificial intelligence MOOC, a very famous MOOC. And they had marketing, they had a big name university, Stanford University, and they had a popular topic, and they had some money. And they attracted 150,000 students, um, which is pretty good. Um, and it was a, that was a huge success, although all it was was a bunch of videos of two professors talking and some quizzes, which is all it is today, actually. It, it hasn't improved. And those two professors, each of them formed a new company. One of them created Coursera, the other one created Udacity. So, and they're in Silicon Valley, they're at Stanford. The thing you do if, you've stole, uh, if you have a good idea is you get venture capitalist funding. And that's what they did. And they each got about 60 million US dollars to build their company. And that's why you don't hear about our MOOCs anymore, <laughs> because we still had no money. Um, and so they became famous. But they had venture capitalist money, so they had to start making money. And so they started selling things, and they did not open source their platform or anything like that. There was an offshoot called edX, and again, it started as something that was open, but then it was, no, we need to make money. Because that's what they do. So where does that leave the rest of us? Well, I'm still developing Grasshopper. It's not very good, but I'm working on it. But there is other technology that you can use. Uh, Moodle is open source software. Um, there are different... Um, wiki uh, applications that are open source. WordPress is open source software that is used uh, to offer a number of MOOCs now. They're not the greatest, but they're, they're, they're no worse than Coursera or RedX. I've worked with these. They're no worse than those. And so you find and share and collaborate and work on free and open source tools. Um, and they don't have to be perfect. This is the thing that I discovered. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to work. You're offering learning and community for free. People will make it work. And the hard part is spending the time and Finding the community, you can't build a community, you have to find a community. Finding a community that is willing to share their resources and, and offer a course online. That's the short answer. There is a longer answer. It's not a simple thing if you don't have a lot of money, but it is possible. But it's only possible through open source software and open educational resources. Otherwise, you have to pay. De esta manera, que les hemos terminado, pues si no tenemos que estar con nosotros, la vez seguimos con un fuerte aplauso. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Can you stop? Okay. Oh, you want me to put these back in? There's more. Okay. Han Gusto. Okay.
Now get off the stage. <laughs> Ahora daremos paso a nuestra segunda sesión de ponencias, en las cuales los expositores tendrán siete minutos para realizarlas y tres para responder las preguntas que ustedes tengan. Entonces, regalemos un momento, vamos a organizar aquí y ya iniciamos. <risa> 